Thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, I want to start out by uh, thanking my husband Avi for setting up the whole room. <laughs> Go husbands. Go husbands, exactly. Um, we're videoing tonight for my family in New York, so we can pan out to the crowd. Hi everyone. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So we've been doing this for, uh, this is our 11th year. It's been 11 years since my father has passed away. And uh, Avi and I have, this is, we've begun a tradition since we lived in Montreal of hosting a shear, um, always choosing something that I thought reg represented who my father was, but oh my God, Alana's already crying. That's <laughs> my sister-in-law. Do you want tissues? Okay. Um, this is usually the one time of year that I cry also. Um, but I, and I open with explaining why I chose the topic that I chose and speaking to you a little bit about who my father was. I know that as parents we get to brag about our children. Um, people don't always appreciate when we brag about our children. And I don't like to walk around bragging about my father, but I feel like this is the once a year that I get to do it and I feel comfortable doing it. So I'm going to open up with a speech. I decided to do something different this year. I wrote a letter to my father that I'm going to read to you. And I actually sent it to my two older sisters who live in New York, and I already got their approval. They totally agree with it, so I'm going to read it to you tonight. My brother Yaakov, I'm so fortunate that he's here with us tonight to represent the family as well. You haven't heard this yet, so here it goes. <laughs> Dear Abba, hello up there. I can't believe that it's been 11 years, and how much has changed since you've been gone. I honestly didn't think that I would be able to make it after your death. Do you remember as a kid how preoccupied I was with the fear of losing you? I would have been a good patient for you. <laughs> I remember crying on your 50th birthday that I didn't want you to get older. And Michal, who's my older sister, pointed one of my older sisters, pointed out to me that it's kind of a downer for the birthday boy when people start crying about them becoming so ancient. And, and I think that was good advice. So if you walk away from tonight's program with anything, I think that's a good takeaway. In all seriousness, I want you to know that I have proudly, and with the help of Hashem, exceeded any of my expectations for surviving in a world without you. Since you've been gone, so much has happened in our family. Personally, I completed my graduate program in psychology. He didn't live to make it to my graduation. I had four children, and Avi and I brought the kids on Aliyah. Can you believe it? The Warhaftig family at large has celebrated four of your grandsons' bar mitzvot, one bat mitzvah, three of your grandsons have already come to spend a year learning in Israel, and we have seen the birth of seven new grandchildren, two of whom are named after you. As I mentioned, four of these new, beautiful, creative, energetic, <laughs> hilarious, and thank God healthy grandchildren belong to me. And I can honestly say that as much as I love them, Parenting has proven to be the hardest job in the world. I don't know how you did it, Abba, but parenting seemed to come so naturally to you. You genuinely, genuinely seem to love being around us all the time. I wonder if my kids would say the same of me. How did you seem to like us so much? How did you have endless amounts of patience for us? How did you rarely ever raise your voice? You certainly are a hard model to measure up to. I know that time is limited tonight, and so I don't want to get carried away with tons of examples of what made you such an incredible parent. The Women's Baby Drash so kindly included a brief biography of your professional accomplishments when they advertised this program tonight. And so now many people know about your many achievements working at the Yeshiva of Flatbush, as director of Camp Marasha, and as principal at the Ray Kushner Yeshiva High School in Livingston, New Jersey. But not everyone knows about all the incredible things that you did for us as a father how you would let us stay up way past our bedtimes if we needed a little one-on-one -on -one time with you. When, I think someone needs a little one-on-one -on -one time. Is she okay? Yeah. Thank you. Or how you love to play card games and board games with us on Chavez when you could have been napping. I mean, you did that too, but that was usually while you studied with us at the Chavez table. Or how when Michal had to attend Sunday school, yeah, that's not common in America. You would wake her up extra early to take her to Nash and Good Donuts just to have some quality time. How you were always available for any deep heart-to-hearts, and you were the place I know that I chose to turn to with any problem. You never got excited or hysterical, 
If we admitted that we did something bad, your response was to say that you trusted us and you believed in us, and this made us not want to let you down. I remember when no one in the family liked a guy that I was dating, and they all made it pretty clear. You decided to go about it differently. You took me out for lunch, and you asked me for his phone number. You explained to me that if this boy was important to me, then you trusted me, and you wanted to take the time to get to know him. You called him up and asked, him, asked to meet him for dinner. And it was not to rough him up or to threaten him, but rather to give me the benefit of the doubt and to try to find the good in him. Needless to say that that relationship did not pan out, <laughs> but I was able to decide that for myself because you trusted in me to make a wise decision. I so regret that you didn't get more of a chance to get to know Avi better. You only knew him for one year, and you have not gotten to see what, amazing, what an amazing husband and father, brother-in-law, son-in-law, and uncle he is. You must be pleased to know that he is getting rave reviews from the rest of the family. I know that you would have loved, you both would have loved and appreciated each other so much. Abba, when it came to love, support, and acceptance of your children, you were the ultimate. Your love was so unconditional, and there was nothing we could ever do, no matter how bad it was, to lose it. How many people can say that they have had that kind of love and acceptance in their lives? I am so thankful that I have had such a blessing be it for such a relatively short amount of time. One of the most amazing qualities about you, which I would like to highlight, was your love for learning and your commitment to working on yourself. I remember that our house was always full of countless books on parenting, psychology, and education. Next to your bed, there was always a stack of books that you were in the middle of reading, all at the same time. These books were crammed with tissues into various pages, marking the passages that you wanted to remember, or marking the places that you left off before you got excited about yet another idea or another author. I recently took a look at my night table, and I smiled to myself when I noted that I have started to do the same thing, and that I now have my own pretty impressive pile of books near my bed. I feel so proud to see little bits of you showing up in me. This year, for the 11th annual lecture, Avi and I decided that we wanted to organize a lecture in your memory on parenting. In previous years, we've had lectures on humility, optimism, the art of listening, a balanced approach to drinking alcohol, it's a long story, <laughs> how to treat all people and children with respect and dignity. Last year, we were honored to have Shani Tarragon here speak to us about the importance of carrying on a, le a family legacy. Before she started her shear, she shared a personal story about how you believed in her as a teenager and offered her her first shot in Kinoch, which some might say she went on to have a bit of success at over the past few decades. I wanted to focus this year on improving our parent-child relationships. I'm very excited tonight to have Dr. Jenny Goldstein with us. When I asked Barbara Ash for a recommendation for a speaker, she immediately recommended Jenny. I've never officially met Jenny, but I think I hear your name almost daily at work. <laughs> you see, Jenny has an incredible reputation as a child and adult psychiatrist in the Gush Young community. She is known for having an extremely warm bedside manner, and she has a way of helping even the most anxious parents feel safe, comfortable, and accepted when dealing with some of the most challenging issues in raising their children. And so I have often recommended your services to people but I hear it's very hard to get an appointment these days. <laughs> I've heard from Barbara that Jenny gives an excellent lecture on the introductory theories of the Ayeka parenting philosophy. I was immediately excited about this, since I have been meaning to learn more about Ayeka since I first heard about it last year. From my limited understanding, Ayeka helps parents learn to not only love their children and connect with them, but also how to teach the, import the importance of setting healthy boundaries and limits so that our children will not develop unhealthy tendencies and habits. I don't know about other parents in the room, but for me, setting limits is hard. Really, really hard. It takes diligence and fortitude. Enough sleep, plenty of coffee, and not being too overwhelmed by work or by life. Abba, you undoubtedly excelled at the connecting, the loving, and the accepting piece of parenting. But I'm not so sure you achieved your full potential in limit setting. I don't know how you feel, Yak. <laughs> Abba, you were really, really nice. And that's probably why we loved you so much. But dare I ask, 
Could there have been even more that you could have offered us beyond love and acceptance? I have no doubt that even if you set more limits, we would have loved you just the same, if not more. I mean, how could we not? To, to have known you was simply to love you. I know that you would have asked yourself this very question, and that you would have been intrigued by the Ayeka approach and by hearing Jenny tonight. If you were alive today, books on this topic would be sitting right there on your night table, crammed with various tissues. <laughs> so in your honor, Avi and I wanted to give our community the opportunity to learn from Jenny, to work on improving our parenting skills so that we can better serve our kids and help them develop stronger and healthier habits and identities. We hope that you are smiling down on us all tonight and that we are making you proud. May your neshama climb even higher from all of our efforts to become better people and parents. With all my love, yeah. Thank you. First of all, Yael, I've never met you. My name is Yael. Uh, I was asked in, in place of Batya this evening to come and just introduce the evening, introduce Jenny. And I have to tell you that as a person who's also lost my parents, um, everything that you do, everything, brings their neshama closer to you, is their legacy. You, it's just right through. That's why I see it. So what you're doing in this lecture tonight, by having it, by bringing Jenny to help us all, it's, it's an illusion nishma town. And uh, thank you so much on behalf of the Women's Bait Midrash for creating an event so that we can all benefit from the legacy that your father passed to you and your family. You're actually sharing that with us, and we're very fortunate to have that. So thank you to you and to Avi for hosting the event, and, and we, so thank you. Um, I did leave on the table um, t information about two series that will be going on in the summer. I just didn't know what to do with myself yesterday morning because I didn't have my regular shirim. It's hard to finish the semester, so this is also a continuation of our yearly learning. There are, um, there's the Sherry Mandel uh, creative writing series. She did it a year or two ago. I was in it. It was absolutely wonderful. And Herzl Efter, again, continuing his Friday morning series. Anyone is welcome to join. Um, I would like to just give a brief introduction. Uh, oh, no. I get it back. Ah! I just got this a few weeks ago. I've just, here we go. OK. Dr. Jenny Goldstein earned her medical degree from the State University of New York, Downstate College of Medicine, and as a US board certified adult and child and adolescent psychiatrist. Her husband, Daniel, was the rabbi at the Kingsway Jewish Center in Brooklyn for 11 years. And in her capacity as Rebbitzin, she taught Torah classes and studied with the Kalotin community. Prior to her aliyah, she served as director of the Child and Adolescent Day Hospital at Sucker Hillside Hospital in New York. Dr. Goldstein maintains a private practice in Neve Daniel Gushetzion, where she and her husband are raising four children. She has lectured at Tel Aviv University Sattler Medical School for organizations including Tsoar, Kav Noah, Shalva, Torin Moshan, and the annual meeting of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists. Dr. Goldstein also supervises other therapists and provides in-service training for, to school facilities. She's a member of a team of professionals working to increase education and awareness about sexual abuse within communities in Israel, and is a consultant at the Trauma Center, Treatment Center of Sterot, working with families affected by terrorism and war on the Gaza border. Turn the meeting over for you, and thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you, Al. I, I feel like we should all just take a deep breath and reflect on everything you said, because that was enough of an honor to your father. We don't need anything else. But I'm here, so I'll continue and hope to live up to what you, uh, what you talked about regarding your father. Um, the truth is that when Batya called me about speaking tonight, we threw around different ideas about what I could speak about. And one of the ideas that came up was discussing Ayaka. And I have to um, admit that as I was preparing tonight, I, I didn't feel comfortable going solely in the Ayaka direction for a very personal reason, which is that I also had a connection with your father, which didn't come up when we were talking because I was saving it to tell you tonight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I just felt like I had to make this night more Torah-focused because of what he gave me Torah-wise. So 
What I'm actually going to do is give a preliminary talk on Ayaka. Um, and there is a lot of talk, which Barbara and I are doing, and other people about bringing Ayaka to the Gush, and it will happen, God willing, and then we'll be able to expand much more on Ayaka. Um, Ayaka is a, is a parenting approach that emphasizes the importance of developing the child's ability to understand the relationship between the parent and child. But for that to happen, first the parent has to understand the relationship between the parent and child. And so I, what I want to do tonight is really focus on a Torah approach to understanding that. Um, my connection to your father is, is actually one which um, requires admitting to the audience that I have always been and continue to be a very big nerd. <laughs> um, the reason that I say that is that I was a member of something called Torah High School Network. I don't know if anybody else here was a Jewish day school. Yes. Yeah. So Torah High School Network, which I don't think is around anymore. Chairman. Where are you? Okay. Torah High School Network. Yes. Okay. So Torah High School Network was an organization that uh, drew together day schools throughout America. I grew up in Boston, so Maimonides was that way linked to all different similarly co-ed day schools of the YU philosophy. And we would get together on the Shabbatonim, and it was a bunch of wonderful kids, and I was a Sternberg girl all my life. I don't know if anybody here knows Cam Sternberg. So I was this very proud Sternberg girl, but then as high school continued, and I was becoming very close with these Torah High School Network friends, they were all in Camp Marasha. And I wanted to go to Camp Marasha to be with all my new Torah High School Network friends. And so I called Rabbi Rahab to get home, and as I was thinking about this, I thought it was probably you who answered the phone. <laughs> and I introduced myself, and I asked him if he had any positions left, and I described myself a little bit, and he said, I think I have the perfect job for you. We need somebody to assist Rabbi Orlean in the library. That sounds like a job for you. And I was thrilled, and for two summers, I had the best job in Camp Marasha, which was to hang out in the library with Rabbi Orlean. And your father somehow knew that that's what I needed and wanted. And, I, and it really were, it was two wonderful schuyot of summers, all in your father's honor, and it really had a big impact on me, and it's totally in his chus. So I had to talk tonight about something Torah-oriented because of what he gave me by allowing me to sit in the Camp Marshall Library all day, which was really it's also a very... also the air-conditioned building. I did. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. <laughs> but yes, I also was very popular because hanging out with me meant hanging out in the library, which was air-conditioned, so that's true also. Um, but it just it didn't feel right to not bring more Torah to tonight because of how much Torah your father offered me. I sat with Rabbi Orlean, for anybody who knows Kent Marasha, I got to sit with Rabbi Orlean from morning until night, pouring over books and understanding where they came from and hearing everything that Rabbi Orlean knew, which was, is everything, and uh, it was a big success. So I am very grateful to your father, and, and that's why I was so excited when, uh, when I heard about the opportunity to, to honor him tonight. Rabbi Rahavtik dedicated his life to educating children and celebrating children. I will be speaking tonight about the importance of parents accepting a child for who he or she is, instead of worrying about what or who he isn't, and instead of dreaming about exactly how you would like her to be. Um, I just realized that I never handed out these sheets, so I'm going to quickly hand those out so that everybody has these sources with them. Okay. Tonight, I'm going to walk you through the connection between three sources in the parish of the Nitziv, the Hamik Davar, in which he develops a theme which is one of his favorites, individualism, and respecting each person for who he is. I will then share with you a few passages from other writings which are meaningful to me because they beautifully capture the idea that being an effective parent means not just acceptance and celebration of the differences between our children, but it means acceptance and celebration of the differences between our children and ourselves. Before we jump into the Nitziv, I want to remind you, as an appetizer, of the Gemara in Brecho, which is source one, that first source on the page, Tanu Rabbanan, Haro'el Chusei Yisrael Omer Baruch Chacham Harazim, 
שאין דעתם דומה זה לזה, ואין פרצופיהם דומים זה לזה. And Rashi explains, חכם הרזים היודע מה שבליב כל אלו. This is the Gemara that introduces the very unusual bracha that you make in a huge crowd, 600,000, I think, uh, Jews in one area. But the wording of the bracha is, Baruch Chacham HaRazim, blessed is God, who understands the wisdom of the secrets. And what Rashi explains is that God knows what's inside the heart of every person. I think of this bracha as God's example to us of appreciating that in a large group of people, every single person is different and unique, and every person needs to be appreciated for who they are, because it's these individuals that make up the large group. The bracha, when you see a large group, is not something reflecting, wow, look at this incredible crowd. It's, wow, look at these individuals which are making up the crowd. And I think that that idea is really what needs to guide us as we think through this idea of parenting. Wow, look at the individuals that are before us. Okay. Now let's jump into the Mahalach of the Nitziv. The Nitziv um, is Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda of Berlin, who died in 1893, in the, late 18th, in the 1890s, the end of the 18th, in the 1800s, in the 19th century. He was the Rosh Hashiva of Elijah, and there's a, a lot that we could talk about him and Israel. There's a lot going on with the Nitziv, but uh, we'll, we'll do that for another night. We'll have the Ayaka night, then we'll have the Nitziv night, and we'll do a series. <laughs> okay, let's jump into this first Nitziv source. That's the, the Pasuk in Devarim. Vata Yisrael, ma Hashem alokach ha-sho'el me'imach, ki im li'ra'at Hashem alokach ha-lalachet b'chol drachav, u'la'ahava uto, v'la'avod et Hashem alokach ha-b'chol levavcha, u'b'chol nafshacha. Okay, and now, uh, B'nai Yisrael, what does Hashem want from you? Just to uh, uh, fear God, and to walk in His ways, and to love Him, and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. The Nitziv now is going to comment on this Pasuk, and he's going to set up the idea in this Pasuk that not everybody is the same. Okay, so this is stage one of the Nitziv's theme, even though he does it out of order in the Torah, obviously, this is Devarim, but stage one of the theme is understanding that not everybody is the same. What does he say? I, I clipped this part from a much longer Nitziv, so that's why it feels like it's picking up in the middle. I just didn't bring the whole it wasn't as relevant. There are four stages or types of people in Israel. He talks more about that there. Now, I want everybody to take a deep breath and relax. The Nitziv is going to say something which in the year 2016 is extremely politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. Please remember that he lived in the 1800s. Fasten your seatbelts, it's gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. You get the idea, even though he says it in a way which he would be really uh, thrown out of any women's big rush program had he said that today, but you understand what he's saying. Shehei echad, rashimu manhigim Israel. there are the leader types. Bet, talmidei chachamim, hanikraim ziknei Yisrael, okay, gimel, Bali batim, oskim the parnasatam, people who have jobs and are trying to make a living, and dalid, nashim ba abadim Okay, we'll just fly right through that. We call a mikitot halalu, a no domela chavero. These four groups, not one is similar to another. The she'ilat ha kadosh barchum imanu, in what God is asking of them. What he, the way we would say that in modern terms without dividing it necessarily into those groups is that God has different requests and expectations of every different type of person. There's no person that God expects the same that he expects of somebody else. It really would have been much quicker for him just to say, all you guys are standing here and here's what you need to know. Why all that specific detail? Everything would have been included in that big one word, in that actually small word. Everybody has his own individual brit with a Kaddish Baruch Hu. 
אינו שואל מזה, וכמעט שאסור לקט השנית כאשר יבואר. Every person has their own breeds, and it's almost a sore to assume that what's good for one person in their relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu is equally good to somebody else. Everybody needs to create their own relationship with God, and uh, inversely, conversely, inversely, God appreciates that everybody is trying to build his own relationship with them. Okay, so this is a very powerful and psychologically minded Nitziv, and one of the reasons the Nitziv is a is very popular in my house. Um, there is a Shabbos table that goes by without the Nitziv uh, being a very big part of our discussion, and, and we're very drawn to him specifically because he is so psychologically minded. And here we see that he's appreciating very much the idea that not everybody is the same. Okay, moving into the second source, which is this Pasuk and Rishi. In the second source, the Nitziv is going to set up the idea that we need to be respectful of these differences, okay? So not only is it a fact that the Nitziv sets up in the first source that there are differences, but what he's saying in the second source is it's not that just God recognizes it. He expects of us to be respectful of those differences, okay? Source 2, Bereshit Perek Memchet, a uh, rather famous pasuk, Okay? Now, here are the, the Nitziv comments in a, an annotation on his, uh, his parish in the Harchev Davar. That we bring this bracha to a Brit Milah. Why? Behainyan Shayadua. It isn't appropriate to bless someone with blessings that are not part of who they are at their core. Rather, you should bless someone to expound on what is part of their core, of the way God made them. If there's a wealthy person, then you should bless him. May God give you continued wealth. And if there's a wise person, then you should bless him. May God continue to give you the strength to learn and to study. Um, where the passage that he's quoting there is the one that says, right, where um, everybody was given a blessing according to who they were. It's not appropriate to say to someone who isn't a learner, you should be like Ephraim. And to someone who really doesn't involve himself in the business world, you shouldn't say to him, and I hope your business goes well and you should really prosper, that's not where he's holding. I just want to take a side point and, and, and explain that part of what made Rabbi Warhaftik so special is that he recognized what the strength of each child was and cheered them on for that strength. And you saw it walking around camp. I can only speak about camp, not school. But you saw it walking around camp. He knew what every kid was good at, and he cheered them on for that. And he would never say to a kid, never say to a kid on the baseball field, why didn't you get yourself to the Bay Midrash a little more? He would say, Good, why don't you spend an extra hour there and work on that shot or whatever, right? So a, a real educator appreciates this and understands this and builds a kid up by emphasizing where their strengths are already potentially rooted in them instead of pushing them to do things which are not part of their wiring. Aval, b'sha'at milah, at the time of a brit milah, d'lo nodan dayin et ha-derech asher ha-yeladilech, but we have no idea yet which way this child is going to go. As Yevarech Yisrael, at that point we say, Yisimcha Elohim Ke'efrayim, Im Yehei Yosef Batorah, Yetzliach Kamohu, Uche Menashe, Im Yeh Asuk Bahavayot HaOlam, Yeh Menashe. In other words, the kavana of the bracha at the Brit Milah should be, whatever your netiyah will be determined to be, you should excel in that. But we don't have an invested interest in you being in any specific way. Whatever is good for you, we really want you to feel good about yourself in that aspect of yourself. Okay? So in the first source, the Nitziv was setting up that God recognizes that there are differences between different types of people. And in the second source, the Nitziv is explaining to us that we as people need to respect these differences. Okay. 
the third source, which is Breshit, Parak Bet, Pasuk Dalek, sets up the idea of how we relate to those differences. And now we're really getting into the uh, meat of the parenting part. This is the essence of God is creating. And everybody through his creation will know that he is the creator and the guide of the whole world. The purpose of earth is to bring greatness to God's name. God is looking out and judging everything going on. But it's man who's guiding how things are going to unfold. And here we are, are referring to that idea that this is all in our hands, how things turn out. Man has two aspects to him. There's the more godly, angelic aspect of human nature. The very mundane aspect of human nature that needs to be down here, rooted on this earth, taking care of business. And these two come together to, cre to, to be the, the uh, aspects of creation that form creation. Because if all humanity stayed at the level of man before the first sin, there would be no onesh. If everybody stayed, if the only aspect of man was this tchuna of the angelic aspect, there would be no sachar onesh on earth. And there would be no ability for God to display his greatness and his chesed on earth. Again, if all of man were perfect and angelic, God's greatness would not be seen. Hold on to that thought. The real greatness of God, what makes God amazing, is seen through that second aspect of man, through the worldly part, through the flawed part, through the imperfect, non-angelic part. God actually comes out as much more great through that second part. If the entire sixth day of creation passed and man had not sinned at all, lo haya efshar menu open adam That second aspect of man, the flawed, imperfect, trying the best that he can aspect of man, would not have been a part of humanity. Because everything that is reflected in the world was found betamsit during those six days. Whatever was meant to be out there in the world was seen on some level during those six days. So if man had not sinned by the time Shabbos rolled in, and I guess they made late Shabbos that week, probably, <laughs> so there was a little more time, but still, had Shabbos come and man had not yet sinned, sorry, I'm just repeating that. And then the earth would not be complete the way God needed it to be. And if man was just created from the very beginning as very flawed, we needed to see both aspects of man before creation was completed, before God said, and that's a wrap, and I'm handing it over to you, and good luck. This is such a, a groundbreaking point that the Nitzvah is saying here. 
had Adam not sinned by the end of the sixth day, God would have had to create another person, George. God would have had to create George, George the sinner, so that there would be sin on earth so that flaws and imperfections and doing the best you can and not always making it would be a part of the human condition. George came around later, not on Friday. And in this way, because um, Adam wouldn't have been born and George would have needed to be born, so that way we would have gotten those shnei yitzirot. What is the Nitzit trying to say here? He's trying to say that God's greatness comes out because man is imperfect. What does that mean, that God's greatness comes out because man's imperfection as opposed to man's perfection. So really the best mashal to think about, I think, in terms of understanding this, is to imagine two teachers who go into the same master's program for education and graduate and come out all enthusiastic and both of them want to go into elementary school education and one gets assigned a class of perfect children and the other gets assigned a class of struggling children. Which teacher is going to get to really show her stuff? The teacher who has the perfect class is not really going to be able to show off what she learned in her program because how hard is it to teach a bunch of perfect kids? It's not so hard, right? So you want to learn, they want to learn. You teach them, they learn, they go home, they do extra credit, they come back, they get the extra credit. <laughs> Sounds so boring. <laughs> The teacher who has the difficult class has to think creatively, has to think about how to inspire them, how to motivate them, how to work with them, how to bring out the best in them. So God, if he only had perfect people to work with, we wouldn't really see his chesed, his patience, his ability to give people a second chance, his ability to put things in their path that they could possibly use to help them. What would be the big deal? So we're a bunch of malachim flying around with wings, big deal, right? But the fact that there's imperfection in the world, that's what allows God's greatness to come out. And the truth is, if we think about this, that's really where the beauty and the gvura of parenting comes in. Relating to the differences in people and giving each what they need, that's what reflects the greatness of God. Most think of this ideal of Kavod Hashem as being resting in the perfection, just like most people think of an ideal parent as having perfect children. That's not so impressive. It's not so impressive to have perfect children because where do you do the work? But if you have children who need extra help, who need to be encouraged, who need a little more patience, that's where your power of parenting really gets exercised and that's where you really get the kudos for working hard as a parent. And again, I, I just have to bring it back to Rabbi Rahafte because it's such a meaningful example. His parenting, as you pointed out, and his education and his emphasis on believing in every child, that's where his greatness was. Because had he been running a class or a school or a camp of perfect children, what would be the big deal? But the ability to take a group of kids and make each one feel good about themselves despite what their flaws are, that's real godless. And that's the third level. Not just that there are different people. And not just respecting their differences, but recognizing that in our treatment of these imperfections, that reveals the true kavod Hashem. And as a parent, that reveals the true gvura of a parent. What I would like to do now is share with you some passages that I think about often in my work with kids, in my work as a parent. And you will all be invited back once we set up whatever we're going to do with Ayaka in this area to then, after we develop our own ability to appreciate our relationship with our child, to then bring our child into that world and help them to understand and appreciate what their relationship with us is all about. But we have to first model for them what it is to appreciate our own relationship with our children. So the first source that I want to share with you, <coughs> um, 
is actually a, a passage from a, a talk that Rav Aaron gave. Rav Aaron Zatzal gave a, a talk, a sicha, to overseas students on July 1st, 2007. This was a talk that after he passed away was being passed around a lot and really grabbed my attention for reasons which you'll understand when I read it for those of you who hadn't seen it at that time. The talk that he gave on July 1st, 2007 was on raising children. And in this talk, which was, which was transcribed by his Talmudim, he talks about and reminds us that parenting is about enjoying our children for who they are, not for who or what they may become one day, and not despite who or what they will never be. And what he wrote is, or said, and was transcribed. Recently, a student quoted me as saying that a father should be ready both to learn with his children and play ball with them. He said, I then added, that if you want the child to want to learn with you, you have to play ball with him. I'm not sure you have to, but despite not remembering making this particular statement, it is the sort of thing I would have said. Still, there is one clarification I want to make. I did not play ball with my children as a trick, as a tactic, and I just have to pause. If anybody was at the funeral of Rav Aro, you heard over and over again how much time he spent playing with his children. It was talked about a lot by all of his kids. I did not think, today I'll play basketball with him, and in a year, we will learn in Chaschina. <laughs> I don't think one should approach it that way. There is joy, there is wonder in the ability to play with one's children. It is not simply a tool, not just instrumental. It is a joy in its own right. And one of the joys which I think God fully permits us and wants us to participate in. I don't harbor any guilt about playing with my children, nor do I regard it as a wasted day. It's part of what being a family is all about. Okay, so this is what the Gadol Hador of our area said about parenting. The next source that I wanna share with you is a uh, passage that's in a book called Expecting Adam by a woman named Martha Beck who writes about the experience of having a special needs child. <laughs> Yay, okay. If you'll cast your mind back to high school biology, you may remember that a species is defined in part by the number of chromosomes in every individual. Adam's extra chromosome makes him as dissimilar from me as a mule is from a donkey. Adam doesn't just do less than a normal child his age might. He does different things. He has different priorities, different tastes, different insights. The immediacy and joy with which he lives his life make rapacious achievement, Harvard style, look a lot like quiet desperation. Adam has slowed me down to the point where I notice what is in front of me. It's mystery and beauty. Instead of thrashing my way through a maze of difficult requirements toward labels and achievements that contain no joy in themselves. Okay. What, what she's sharing here is that if you have a child who academically might not be your definition of academic achievement, stop and think about in what way they're teaching you from another angle. And how could you learn from them in a different way that might not be the way that you originally thought of as high level education, but because of the way they view the world is a different form of high level education. It's up to us to open our eyes to be able to see that in every child. I remember one of my favorite parts in that book yeah. is on Christmas, she gave him some sort of like helicopter with batteries and he opened the batteries first and he was so excited. He was running around the house bragging that he got batteries for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and she said that it taught her such a valuable lesson. Exactly. <laughs> you, you, you just, I have to share the story because it's so funny. I, I, it looks like most of the people in this room are Olim as well, right? Some newer, some later. I remember when, when we lived in Brooklyn before we made Aliyah, now in our kitchen we're constantly playing sports radio from New York. When we were living in New York, we were constantly playing Arutz Sheva. <laughs> so I don't know exactly why we can't listen to Arutz Sheva in Israel, but so it is. And there was this show, I forget what it was called, but it was like the Aliyah program, something like that. And there was a woman who was talking and she said, Israel is so great, children are happy with whatever they have. As a matter of fact, right now, my children are in the hallway playing with a toothpaste box. It's so beautiful. And I turned to my husband and I said, oh my God, what are we doing? But the truth is, it's true. 
kids here learn how to play on a much more simple, excited level with what's around them than kids in America do. It's for, sorry to offend, or Australia, or England, or mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but, but then, then kids of Chutzlaretz do, because there is a certain wonderment about living in Israel that's brought out by raising your kids here, which we were just not Zoha to in America. I'm gonna get to that at the end. There's also no target. So. And there's no turn, so you have no choice. You have to play with the dirt. Exactly. exactly. Okay. The next source that I want to share with you is uh, possibly one of my most favorite paragraphs ever written um, by a, a psychologist named Andrew Solomon, who wrote a book called Far From the Tree, highly recommended reading. Far From the Tree is a book about this thick, so you get a lot of tissues to stick in because it's gonna take you a long time to read. What he did was he wrote a book about the experience of parenting a child who is different than you. And every chapter is about a different type of child. So there's a Down syndrome child and a deaf child, a child who is a criminal, what it's like to parent, a child who's homosexual, um, I forget all the other chapters, there are many, but the experience of parenting a child who is different than you, it's a beautiful book, and this is uh, the opening of the book. There is no such thing as reproduction. When two people decide to have a baby, they engage in an act of production. And the widespread use of the word reproduction for this activity, with its implication that two people are but braiding themselves together, is at best a euphemism to comfort prospective parents before they get in <laughs> over their heads. In the subconscious fantasies that make conception look so alluring, it is often ourselves that we would like to see live forever, not someone with a personality of his own. Having anticipated the onward march of our selfish genes, many of us are unprepared for children who present unfamiliar needs. Parenthood abruptly catapults us, us, catapults us into a permanent relationship with a stranger. And the more alien the stranger, the stronger the whiff of negativity. We depend on the guarantee in our children's faces that we will not die. Children whose defining quality annihilates that fantasy of immortality are a particular insult. We must love them for themselves and not for the best of ourselves in them. And that is a great deal harder to do. Loving our own children is an exercise for the imagination. I want to close with a very famous song slash poem, which you have all heard before, but I want to bring it to you now to think about it in the context of this talk. We actually have this hanging in our dining room because I feel like it's such an important uh, idea, theme, chizuk, to think about as you're walking around your house. And what I'm going to read to you is the, the song of Naomi Shammar, which is based on the words of Rabbi Nachman. Everybody knows the song, but now think about it in light of what we've been talking about. Dalcha shekol ro'e v'ro'e, yesh lo nigun miyuchad mishalo. Dalcha shekol esav ha'esav, yesh lo shira miyuchadet mishalo. Umishira ta'asavim na'ase nigun shel ro'e. Kama yafa, kama yafa v'na'e k'shashom'im ha'shira shalahem. Tov ma'od l'hitpalel b'nehem. U'v'simcha l'avod et Hashem. U'mishira ta'asabim mitmalei ha'lev u'v'shtokek. This last paragraph ties together now the idea that, um, my, my drasha on this song, that as a parent, we have to recognize the beauty of every blade in the family and recognize the song that's created by these blades. But we in this room have a particular schut to do that here in Israel. And there is something about this country and the way this country is run that does allow for children to really excel in whatever it is that makes them special. And I encourage all of you to look around society and find a way 
to identify a place for your child to grow and develop because there is something unique in this country that was not available from wherever you came that really gives children the opportunity to shine no matter what it is that their core element, if they're Ephraim, if they're Menashe, or anything in between, whatever their core element is.